Thank you for joining us. It's good to have us in your office. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. So talk to us a little about Joshua Oigara and where he was born and grew up. You know, Sophia was born up in the, the highlands. You know, where it rains a lot. It's in the highlands of Bomet, not far away from Kericho Forest. It's part of our settlement scheme, uh, which, and that's where I grew up in school. We had big farms. Uh, you know, my father was doing a lot of agriculture, so coffee and tea and livestock and pyrethrum. So I, I kind of grew like any other basic Kenyan, I must say. Yeah. So are you involved in the farming? Would you go to the shamba? Yes, when I was growing up, of course. Uh, not a lot, but we used to, uh, you know, when you're doing about tea production and, and farming. My, my dad was very critical about education as a long-term inheritance for his mm -hmm. children. So we kind of went to boarding school when we were very young. So uh, I think on the third grade, uh, fourth grade, actually, we went to boarding school. So yes, over the holidays, we could spend some time on the farm, yeah. but not too much. We were big producers of milk at that time. You know, if you're doing 100 liters in a day, then it was a lot of milk. We were doing 1,000 uh, kilos of, of tea at that time. It was a lot. Yeah. Uh, but now we don't see that happening a lot. But that was a great time, I must say. And going to uh, boarding school so young, yes. did you struggle with that? Yeah, my dad was a very strong Adventist, so he grew up strongly and his view was about education is the only way to be able to bring breakthrough, to create change in your world. And I learned many things in there. I found many younger kids in Adventists or any other schools. So a lot of the church-led, whether it's Pentecostal, whether it's Presbyterian, whether it's Catholic, a lot of them have got a lot of institutional learning, which are some of the best institutions we have today in the country. Yeah, so no homesick feeling like, yeah, I went to school all of the time and as a kid. Yeah, he used yeah. to come. He used to come a couple of times. Uh, he was a very strict uh, father, I must say. And my mom used to send my, you know, um, the youngest son, yeah. so my elder brother could come in once in a while or twice, uh, once a month, just to check how I'm doing. Yeah. And that was great, I must say. Just one sibling growing up. And I'm saying that I was the youngest son, but I have got other, other elder brothers, I've got elder sisters, some of them who are out of the country today. Mm -hmm. I, and, and it's true, that vision really created. We have a lot of, in my family, we have got two professors, we have two doctors. So they have a lot of people who have really advanced in education. And when I speak to them, I really listen. And some of them training out of the world. Like my brother in Syracuse is a professor for many years. And my sister is a professor here. And therefore, it's an important part of both upbringing and building in those days in the 70s, exactly. And in today is the way you can momentously change the destiny of our future as a country using education. Education. So growing up, did your father also steer you into what perhaps he thought, you know, you should go down in terms of career, the direction you should take? Or was it something you were more taking the lead on? Well, it was very clear that business is the way I needed to be able to grow the, my future. So he, he didn't know what business. Okay. So that's an area he was very much saying, you're going to be strong in mathematics, in science. So the two things he used to say. And he says, you know, I have got a farm, but I'm not going to give you the inheritance of the farm. The only inheritance I'm going to give you as a younger person is your education. Mm -hmm. Use it. His vision was to build you a better student, a better graduate with a higher education than himself. Yeah. So he had, a, he, had, he had a diploma. He said a student needs to get a degree, postgraduates, and PhDs, and whatever. And that's what he did for his children. Okay. So what did you do post-secondary school? What did so, you so I studied in finance and accounting. Started actually in Kenya. Started at the University of Nairobi at the Lower Kabeta Business School. But I also studied in Strathmore Business School for my accountant's qualification. And then went ahead to study at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Uh, studied in Fuqua Business School at the University of Duke. I studied in uh, postgraduate um, in Australia, um, you know, in Edith Cowan University, and then been able to do some work at uh, Fontainebleau in France, which is the uh, INSEAD, which is an institution, so very, one of the best schools we have today in, in yeah. Europe. So that has been, a, it's all in business areas, really, about integrating business, connecting society, and saying, can you use the knowledge we have to better the future of our destiny as human beings in our planet? Yeah, because many parents will be like, yeah, when you grow up, you need to be a lawyer, a doctor, a pilot, so your dad was all about business. And is it something you felt as well, or did you want to venture into something else? Well, I would say I was lucky, uh, Sophie. I was lucky because, you know, we, we have engineers, we have doctors, yes. we have lawyers. So as a young, a last born son, I had, you know, my dad didn't think we'd go far away from where he lived. And so a business was a key area. I could invest in business. I could grow closer to where he was. I guess if I was the first born, maybe my, my first born, uh, second born sister is a medical doctor. You see, and that was her journey since she was young. I love business because there are two things we can do in business. We can connect the aspirations of our people today, ordinary people, that's what they call ordinary people, millions of Africans, to dream to become extraordinary by investing in their businesses, supporting them in the value chain of our business, and enabling them to achieve their dreams. 
if there's one thing I'm passionate about about my life, it's about living a better impact for the people that we live for, we stand for, our children and the next generation. So your father must be proud of you. Well, unfortunately, passed on many years ago. Yeah. So I'm sure whatever he is today, he's looking he, down and he's saying, very proud. "Good, good yeah, stuff." Yeah. But, but, but there were many. But when I was growing up, there were so many people I can't remember. It's very hard to tell. You know, in those days, many people were not taking their children to school. Yeah. It's not very long time. It was in the mid 70s when I was born in 75. Mm -hmm. You see, many times there was no one to educate them in schools. There was primary school, but in high school there was no one to take you to school. So he used to put all his resources and funds in it. So I remember one time we had 40 pies at home. I, I can't tell whether they are relatives or not, but we are going to the same school. And that is the destiny and the philosophy of what I live today, creating transformation, creating change. There is no point of creating one successful standing individual in the middle of people who are failures, which is an African cancer today. How do we connect each and every person to build what I call inclusive growth and prosperity for all of us? Okay. What was your first job? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, a really formal job? You can start with informal if you're so shy in the neighborhood. No, no, so. I mean, I was a teacher. Okay. I love teaching. I love sharing my own experiences. It's the reason why we don't grow to become big and have bigger dreams, because we don't see. We don't see possibilities in our business, in our lives, in our society. So if I grew up in the village and my view is to become a teacher, that's what I saw. But now I realize I can become a global CEO. I can lead the largest organization in the world today, for instance, General Electric. You can be a CEO for Apple today. Every single young person knows about Apple today, correct? I can become the largest CEO to the CEO of Alibaba today. Mm -hmm. See, these are the kind of things that you can aspire. So in my view, I started teaching and sharing my experience what after after college. I was teaching mathematics. What class, yeah, primary yeah. school? High, high school, high school, school. high school. I was wow. from four, from four students. For how long? So I thought like four, not a long, but one year. Did you at some point imagine you'd then forever be a teacher? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> but I love the role that teachers play, not just in my life, but in the country. I mean, without that fast level of information and knowledge, we will never become who we are today. Yeah. And the self-service they have to deliver an outstanding and amazing service every day, in my view, is second to none. Yeah. What do you attribute to getting to the very top of your industry, and yet very young? How old are you? Well, you know, this age, Sophia, is an issue that everyone <laughs> keeps talking about. I, 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 I would say two things. It's important to be young. Because I think you've got the energy, the dynamism, you have the network. All, I mean, uh, all our people in Kenya, most of them, 65% are young people below the age of 30, correct? And that is the aspirations and hope of this generation will be the, the true basis for which we can deliver a better Kenya, a better East Africa, and a much more prosperous world. So we must connect with them, and I feel that is the conviction I need. One thing I've done very strongly, I started my, I started my former career with PricewaterhouseCoopers, working in advisory, in audits. And that was a big stretch. You know, you find yourself in a place with the best of the best. It's one thing to work with average. My vision in life has been being the best wherever I am yeah. and enabling my team to be the best. And so you've gotten, what's 40? Well, I'll be 40 in November this year. November this year. Correct. And you're, I'm looking forward, actually. You're looking for forward? You Correct. better have a huge party. It's, it's, a, it's a milestone, no? I don't, probably don't celebrate parties for birthday. My, my view is that what is important is the milestones and landmarks we've left in the hearts and minds of millions of people that have contacted us. Mm -hmm. Maybe I will spend that time with Judith and the team and Anne. We have a team of close to 1,000 young people, students, we take to school. We pay for their, for their school fees, we mentor them, we coach them, we support them through the four-year education in high school. And just last week I was in Alliance two weeks ago seeing the 45 kids we have in school. That is my inspiration. If I share a day with a thousand of them together and kind of, that is the visionaries we're creating for the future of our country and our region. That would be a day better spent. And back to the question, significance that at that young age, quite honestly, I'll take you back to that because the significance of it is there are very many young people who want to be all of these great things. Correct. But you've managed to transcend to the, you know, highest level of your industry, even being the chairman of the Kenyan bankers. So. What is it? Is it hard work? Is it what you dreamt big and you got lucky? How do you see it? As Sophia, I would say two things though. I mean, one, there isn't a shortcut in anything. There's a philosophy that you go to school. I, like, I imagine just a life story about kids going to school, primary school, high school, university. They're very hardworking, extremely hardworking. Of course, few of them may not be. But after they come and they get their first job, suddenly it's time to breathe. If you are destined to create greatness and create changes, there's no time to rest. It's a lifelong journey. In the words of Barack Obama, 
is that you cannot wait. Change cannot wait for another person to come and create a change. It is us. We are the change we've been waiting for. It is the time to create the change ourselves. If I look at President Paul Kagame speaking very strongly last year in the presidential summit that I chaired, he talked about Africa being built by Africans. So we are always waiting. So younger people, if you sit at home on Facebook, you're sitting at home on social media, you're sitting at home watching music, or you, I'm not saying it's, it's bad, but you can't spend the whole day. Kids in Hong Kong today, in Tokyo, in London, in New York, in South Africa, are pushing the agenda of development. Yeah. They are becoming catalysts. We need to be there. We're not different. Music will come. We want, I prefer that you become Beyonce, create Rihanna, create the biggest music. That's the biggest philosophy. So my view has been becoming outstanding. So do, and I say, let's think everywhere we are. The biggest challenge I find in the younger generation is we are always thinking very local. And that's why I like, for instance, later on in the month of July, that we are going to host the biggest inter enterprise summit in Africa, in the world today, in Nairobi, correct? Because we can be able to aim and dream big. You, it takes the same amount of time, Sophia, to dream. So why dream a small item? You're so, wasting your time. Yeah. What a waste. Yeah. Would you then say you're a workaholic, that you're constantly pushing yourself, setting um, these marks for you, you achieve, you go to the next? What is it you... So here there's some words that don't really exist in my vocabulary. And if you think about the English dictionary, they are all disappearing. Impossible, workaholic, no balance. If you, want, if you think about Steve Jobs, if you think about Bill Gates, if you think about Nelson Mandela, if you think about those breakthrough, you see breakthrough. You see less. And, and to make a milestone landmark for a company like KCB today, you're going to focus on development and changes and transformation. Mm -hmm. That is the journey you're running. Correct? And, and, that, and so I wouldn't consider myself, I spend more time focusing, I a, I'm very privileged to have a very good team. Uh, I mean, better than me. I don't aspire to know everything. I've got better people, stronger people, more experienced people working for me. But I am very clear that in terms of a journey, it's a movement to create a better Kenya, a better Africa, and a better world. That is, if that I do and I lose more time at home, I am prepared to pay the price for it. Yeah. So away from being CEO, uh, away from the serious business, what do you do in your downtime? Well, if there is any such word in your dictionary. <laughs> well, we sp I spend a lot of time, uh, we have a foundation that you're, you probably may not be aware, but K KCB Foundation is one of the few, uh, you know, original and has been here for a while. It's actually a pioneer you know, with the Firecom Foundation as well. And what we spend time is to invest in areas in our society where we feel we can create a real impact. We want to formalize people who are informal today in their lives. So for instance, we're working with farmers, basic farmers in rural areas who have got some livestock. We want to triple their level of income. You know, for a person earning a dollar a day, it's a different conversation, Sophia. If we can triple that, it's a 300% increase. They can take their kids to school. They can pay for their Medicare, they can be better dressed, they can be taller, they're walking, they can be proud African, they can contribute to the future destiny of our continent. Yeah. That I spend time on. So I'm a trustee of a KCB Foundation. And I have children, so we have, we have a thousand children now. We want to grow this bigger in high school that we pay for them, mentor them, speak to them. We also we involved in kidney programs, you know, children and die, and we're always spending time as a group, as a bank. So I spend time. When I'm free also, I get time to play tennis. Which so you find me sometimes table in table tennis, tennis, table tennis. I can beat you up at table tennis. Wow, well, we'll get a duel after this at yeah? some stage this year. I wish you had a table here. I've shown you <laughs> dust. <laughs> <laughs> I get time to do that. I and I also speak. When I get some free time, I, I get a chance to speak to younger people. So I speak to many college students, university students, high school students, like I was at uh, Alliance High School uh, just the other day. And a fantastic speaking to 1,500 young people. I mean, you see the energy, the conviction, and that's our role must be giving back. We must stand firm. We must be, in my view, as leaders today, the footprint that others can step on and get their scalability, get themselves to fly high. Yeah. So that collaboration is what I'm looking for today as a leader, and that's what I'm doing. But I will spend more time teaching and sharing my own experience. That's what we lack most. Today. All right. You keep fit. You look fit. Work out. Eat, well, well I, run, I run every morning. Every morning. Every morning. How long? Uh, five kilometers in half an hour. In half hour? Yes. Not much. I don't run very fast. My speed is around eight kilometers per okay. hour. So I'm, I'm that on a treadmill will be what speed? Well, the treadmill, I don't know. But I, I do I have a sport watch, so I always monitor the time I'm, I'm, I'm running. My goal was to run. I have been really challenged by the first lady, Her Excellency. We work very closely with Judith, with our foundation, on the program she has of maternal health. And as a leader, we've been invested from every single day of the program. We've been partners from day one. 
And I promised that I would get a chance to run, not, not the marathon, but I run the 10 kilometers. <laughs> and that's what I'm preparing myself. I participate. Maybe in the future, I will see that I can run the 21 kilometers, the half marathon. Yeah, but it's, yeah, you can. absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's for me is the aspiration that all of us can connect. I also watch what I eat as well. Uh, and that's, you know, you need to be able to be fit. I mean, ultimately, as an individual, take care of what you do. The, the small steps you make today have a big impact in the life ahead that you have. And, and, and I'll speak, Sophia, about something that we don't speak a lot about in Africa. We are in a generation that I call the 100-year life generation. For sure, this generation will live to the year 100. So if I spend my time partying and resting now, and I retire at 65, I'm going to have 35 new years, mm -hmm. more years. What am I going to do? Okay. I have all the time coming up. So you, you, are you going to go back to school? So I challenge younger people to invest today, increase their skills, invest in themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is what will cut, push them to become globally centric. The conversation should be about how do I become better than my friends in San Francisco. Okay. Do you have a mentor? Well, I don't have a mentor today. Over my years, I've grown with people that I admire. Yeah? I, don't, I don't talk to them, correct? Um, I don't always meet them. When I grew up, I got a privilege to speak to I admired the global president uh, for Lafarge, a business I worked with for a long time. You know, at that time we were 89,000 staff, and I got a chance to know him personally. To run a business in 99 countries, you know, which is bigger than most of the African countries today, I think it was amazing. I could sit down for coffee once in a year. That challenged me that in my position, I could be actually global. Mm -hmm. So that was five years ago. I love the work, the work and life of Nelson Mandela, about one person fighting. I have a different belief in what I can encourage. We all, we all want to become the Nelson Mandela. We want to become the Beyonce. We want to become um, the biggest icons. We want to become the, the Floyd Mayweather, whatever you call it. But we don't want to invest in their life. If you ask Rana how many times she's on the gym a whole day, we don't want to invest in that time. It would never happen. You would never wake up today. I mean, our philosophy in this generation that you wake up and become a millionaire tomorrow without investing in yourself and working for it, I think is the biggest catastrophe in this generation. It will never happen unless you're lucky. And you can't build your life on luck. Yeah, and luck doesn't hold. Yeah. Hold. You need some luck in life. I mean, to win a lot of you need some luck. <laughs> but in my view, yeah. all of us can, if luck was that easy, we all would not be here. I know. Yeah. Okay. And luck is not being benchmarked on in Japan, in Singapore, in London, in New York, in San Francisco. It's not. So we're not different today. And, and for me, there's a message I'd like to share with my younger, fellow younger people today. If you work at it nicely and greatly, you'll become globally outstanding. Correct. Let's talk banking now. And it's viewed, there's a perception that it's a very lucrative business. Um, you agree with that assessment? And if so, what is driving that? Well, I would say that banking sector is, and I speak as the chairman of the Kenya Bank, is fairly misunderstood across the world. We deliver some of the lowest return of assets in the industry across sectors. Banks average ROA, return on assets, is for well, the assets you have, what return you have, to get it, it's 5%. You have industries that generate 25%. If you look at return on equities, yeah, which is how much shareholders are returning for the investment, we are getting 22, 25% to 30%. The industry delivering 50, 60%. You know, if you look at typical manufacturing, you're looking at typical mining companies, telecommunication companies, it's very different. The reason why banks make the headlines is because the numbers look big. But that is natural because banks are a nexus. They're in the nerve center of economic transformation activity. So our, we handle transactions four or five times GDP. And therefore, if we, our GDP is $45, $50 billion, we'll handle three, four times. That shows the numbers are bigger. But I can assure you, Sophia, if you put together the small and medium enterprises, business volumes, and you register them, they'll be much bigger than financial institutions. Yeah. The difference with banks, we publish our numbers, we publish our results. I am not saying that we're not doing well as a sector. I think banks has been at the cornerstone of economic transformation. So telecommunication sector, if you look at the whole industry of telecoms, the digital side, the mobiles, banks have been enabling all the construction of masts. You look at the railways, banks have been involved. You look at the roads, banks have been involved. The ports, banks have been involved. The schools, that is what the drivers. If you look at housing, just look at housing in Nairobi the last 10 years. We have got built close to 150,000 homes. And, and although there's a conversation that there are not enough mortgages in the market, but the homes in the market, a lot of people are renting, and we'd like to see how to build 
a journey for a million mortgages. Yeah. You see, how do we enable Kenyans? The homes are there. Correct. If you look at education institutions, if you look at what Jomo Kenyatta University is doing, if you look at the JKU Art, what they're doing, more universities, what they're doing, that shows you that banks are involved in the center of economic development. Okay. I love that very much, and that creates the opportunity for financial institutions. And KCB is one of the top banks in the country. I don't know how you rank banks. You can explain that to us in as far as performances. And uh, what is it that is driving the same as well? I would say it's a great privilege for me to serve as a captain of such a transformative and innovative organization. So we, we benchmark a lot. As a bank, we have been uh, soon, next year, we're going to celebrate our 120th birthday. There are very few organizations in our market today that I know are that old. The fact that we have still been the, the leading financial institutions by deposits, by loans, by capital, by branch network, uh, that, that's large. Even in a number of countries today, we are still the largest by far. You know, we are still in six countries. And we are still, we're looking into expanding to more countries. We are looking at Mozambique very seriously today. We are looking at Ethiopia. I've just come from Addis Ababa last week. So we are looking at the Horn of Africa is our natural footprint. We follow our customers. That's how our storage grows. And we want to, exp we, we, our story is about Kenya and East Africa. We want Kenyan businesses to expand in the region. We want Rwandese businesses to expand in the region. We want South Sudanese customers to expand in the region. That's the platform we offer. But what has been a key driver is, has been the inno being innovation centric on mobile technology. So agency banking is one item, mobile banking and mobile money transfer. And I've also been a key c proponent of what I call collaboration, 21st century transfer, tra collaboration, especially what you're doing with Safaricom. Yeah, because uh, one would wonder, isn't there a sense of feeling of perhaps even a threatened by these mobile uh, companies that will come up and take on financial um, uh, monetary kind of activities, that then they're becoming so big? Does that threaten the banking industry? Sophia, I would say that big in itself is not a problem. I mean, you, you, talk, you know, big is relative. In the context of a global market, African businesses are small. We're insignificant. It's a fact. The largest bank today is a thousand times we are. And they're not being seen as big in their market. Does it make sense? Yeah. The largest bank globally is not being seen as big in the market, and they are a thousand times bigger than us. Yeah. We, we must shift. You know, I always say my staff that the greatest tragedy in Africa today is not having high ambitions. It's having smaller goals and ambitions and celebrating achieving small ambitions. So the banks are not threatened yeah. by this. So uh, threats, uh, you must get away from your fears. You've never grown to lead if you're threatened by someone who's growing. You build collaborations. Is that uh, what is informing your collaboration with Safari? The next frontier of growth is about, I cannot be strong in everything, correct? We don't have such, uh, you know, in a, a global giant that is everything where they are. I, don't, I, I cannot be the road contractor today. I cannot be the mobile company tomorrow. I cannot be the biggest hotel tomorrow. I can't be the bank today. I need to be able to find partners that we work with that are strategically positioned to building transforming agenda. I love the DNA of the organizations. So what are you standing for? Profit is not the only thing we stand for. I believe the role of business today is to build stronger communities, invest in societies, create solutions for problems, and make money while doing it. Yeah. That is a shift in the narrative for the last century. Financial markets think profits, profits, profits. Correct? And that's why businesses don't survive beyond the next 20th birthday. But if you can think about connect, so mobile banking, look at m -Pesa. I'm very proud about m -Pesa innovation. We can plug in in the network and offer revolutionary products. For instance, we're offering loan product to our customers, the partnerships. Today, we can offer 100 shillings, Sophia, 100 shillings. Now, for you, it may look small. But for millions of customers in Kenya, we have now have close to 2 million customers, mm -hmm. correct? In the new platform, after three months. And most of the customers, we have lent more than 3 billion shillings in three months. Wow. A billion shillings have been paid. And these customers today, we're not asking them for collateral security. We're asking them to come in and have a credit score, have a good record. On that basis, we give them funds from a mobile phone. And why I'm saying that, see, mobile is about life. We want to be a bank that listens. We want to be simpler. The next frontier of our growth as a business is to grow into more countries but deliver the same level of experience to our customers across our network. Mm -hmm. And we haven't done, we are not yet, I'm not satisfied as a CEO of the largest bank in the region. And we won many global awards. You just need to look at the banker giving us global awards, the euro money giving us global awards, uh, you know, the whole on locally here, you know, being given global awards. That's important for us. It gives us confirmation we're on the right track. Yeah. But I think we need to shift the entire industry 
to position it as the top most industry in Africa. So collaboration is what you believe in. You're in East Africa as well. Correct. We saw equity the other days uh, go into DRC. So Correct. yes, you have a presence and engagement to some of these other countries outside of East Africa, but are you looking into opening branches in these other countries as well? You know, if, if our history is something to go by, they always say if you want to look at someone in strength, look at his past. Mm -hmm. We were 18 years ago, we were the first bank to say, let's take Kenya International. We set up a business in Tanzania, extremely profitable business. And many years later, we set up and said, we want to go to Uganda. We set up a business in Uganda. We set up a business in South Sudan. We set up a business in Rwanda. We set up a business in Burundi. We're, we're the first bank. We're actually the only bank even today, which is in the entire EEC today. Yeah. And so naturally, our expansion is going to happen. You know, we have, in, 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 in the DRC, we already have a strong collaborative partnership with one of the, the largest bank, the most innovative bank, right. uh, a trust market bank that we worked with for many years. And we will continue to strengthen our positioning, not necessarily on an acquisition basis, but our customer. What is important is to enable our trading customers, large, small, and medium enterprises, transact between the Eastern Congo, the Western Congo, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Kenya, and South Sudan. That's what we're doing today. We're looking at Mozambique. So this, and I've mentioned that before, that. We like banks to go regional. We like that there's no distinction. We like banks to go regional. I think is how we can deliver a universal level of service, which is premier for customers. That's what will make us successful. Yeah. So, you know, Ethiopia, we are working with them very closely. We are working to build a rep office in Ethiopia. We are working on that. In this year, we are working very closely to do our business in Mozambique. And we want to strengthen strongly our own strategic partnership with the Trust Merchant Bank in the DRC, which we are working with today. And that's an area we'll continue to build on uh, in the days to come. Then also, we looked at Zambia as a market for our entry. And for two years, we looked at a plan. We wanted to be in the market. We still have that plan. So 10 countries is our plan. We're already in six. Uh, by the year 2017, 2018 will actually be ahead of the target. So what is it you're doing? Because you, you mentioned some of the areas in which you're leading the pack. Correct. So being at the top comes also with concerns of, you know, what is going to bring you down. So you are working very hard to stay up there. What Correct. is it you're keeping in and putting in place to ensure you continue to go higher or at least maintain some of the leading positions you're in? Well, you know, being in a, and this is a very good question. You know, there's this view that when you're in the leadership positions, you've arrived. We never really arrive in our business. In fact, no one ever arrives. If you look at the global companies today, Apple was never in the leading position 10 years ago. Alibaba five years ago was never in the leading position of technology companies today. And, and, and that is the philosophy we run as our business, that technology will be the key catalyst to transform our business. So we're investing, like this year we're investing in a major project to enhance our banking solutions and software today to the latest version. It's a big investment to handle 50 million customers. So we're thinking big for the next five years. We're looking at how to look at our risk management and increasing credit access to If there's one thing we can do is to enhance credit to millions of East Africans who have no access today. And it's a true belief. You don't need security. Just because today you have 100 shillings on a day doesn't mean you should pay the highest interest. So our mobile banking, our new product, the Safari from KCB and PESA, completely crushed the rates. We said we'll offer 2% per month. People say 2% is high. But what is the alternative? High is relative. High is not absolute. So if the market is offering 8% and we're offering 2%, it's a dramatic shift in the cost of financing for these businesses. And that is the innovation we'll continue to do. We look at the, those are the, for me, I see opportunities. And I must thank, I work very closely to a lot of the East, all East African governments, you know, ministers, you know, regulators, in my view, in this moment, it's very historic because a lot has been invested, infrastructure, technology, you know, think about regulation, ports, airports. The government has run the race. My view is that the private sector and entrepreneurs in this moment need to create the next leap which will see us run the next dash okay. to win the marathon. Yeah. And what do you see and would you describe as the biggest challenge KCB is facing right now? I mean, our big challenge remains, Sophie, that you know, we have over 7,500 staff. By far, we're one of the largest employers in the region. In still, when you're successful as an organization, is how to use that success to build your next level of success. It's not always. People who are successful generally say, I'm successful. The race we run is the race that David Rudisha runs. How do I become a global champion? and break my own world record. So our role as a bank, and our biggest challenge, is to outcompete ourselves. When you've been a leader for long, 
and you're there in number one position, you need to be able to fight to become better. If there's one thing we can do across our staff, which I say is our greatest challenge, yet an opportunity is to become better tomorrow than ourselves so, today. So the CBK had uh, CBR by 10%. Correct. And everybody else, the Kenyans, thinking this then will portend more expensive loans, mortgages. Is that the case? I mean, today where we're standing as an industry, we have not increased our rates yet today. But is it in the works? I mean, I, I, I always believe that um, if the central bank has given a signal in the market, as an industry, what you're doing is to follow through. But, it, but the next review is going to happen in the month of August. And that's, so by the end of July, the CBR has been one year in place. And I think at that meeting is when the central bank will have a view. So the rates now are not changing until the next MPC meeting, which will happen in the end of August. Yeah. 20,000, there are about uh, yes. registered mortgages. Correct. And there's a huge concern that the banks are frustrating Kenyans uh, from owning homes. Do you agree with that assessment, that it is the expensive nature of the interest rates in as far as getting and owning homes that is the biggest imp impediment for Kenyans who want to? Well, let me say two things. And this is a very important question, Sophia. And thanks for asking me this questions. You know, there are two ways Kenyans build homes. There are those that come and take a mortgage, they take 10 years, they have a deposit, and by the way, we created an innovation of 105% home loan. You just walk in, you don't have to pay anything else, we'll give you the loan. It's the first innovation in the market, correct? We also have today Kenyans what we call a basic home loan that is available for any customers who wants to build. You know what you call Maga Magwe. If you know Maga Magwe, it comes to build, throw stones, build timber, puts everything. That's how Kenyans build. You go to Tengela, yeah. go to Ngong, go to anyone else. People build homes. Those stones, correct? Those are homeowners. They're not mortgages. The guy in Tengela is not living outside. It's his house. It has no asset. It has no loan. And we provide those facilities for themselves. And, and what I think we can do better as an organization. So let me clarify that in terms of there are more than 20,000 homes. Yes. There are more than 20,000 homes. When we did the survey, we found in ourselves that 80% of Kenyans have a form of a home. They do. We, we know the Kenya Bank Association has done a survey on home ownership. And if you go to Kitale today, you go to Mpeketon, you go to Musambweni, you go to, to uh, you know, whether you're going to Garissa, people have homes. That's their homes. Correct? That's not what the mortgage is focusing on. It is that in the centers today, in the economic centers, the 47 counties, the whole economic centers of this country, can we provide a mortgage financing for those who want to invest long term? And this is where the conversation happens. So interest rate is just one of the components. What I love the conversation to be, Sophia, is how do we bring in a consortium, building materials, steel, cement, land, approvals, you know, documentation. So there's a lot that plays into the expenses, if not just the rates. Exactly. I mean, the rate has been, I say, is one item, but the rate itself. Today, I give this example, Sophia. If I give an interest rate on a loan of 10 million at 0%, you'll pay at least 100,000 per month for 10 years. Now, how many Kenyans could afford 100,000 today? You see the statistics, how many? To break through housing, we're working very closely with the Ministry of Lands and the National Housing Corporation towards a million mortgages. But those homes must be between one to three million shillings. Yeah. One to, in Nairobi, correct? Now, we don't have, you, Sophia, look for a house of one million in Nairobi and we'll find it today. It's very hard to find, correct? With good infrastructure, good schools, good housing, there are roads there, there's a church, there's a hospital. So that's, and I mean, it's not unique. Brazil, Mexico, China, Italy, Singapore has done it. They're affordable homes. So we need to rethink. Our biggest problem is to shift our mind. We, I call it madness, looking at the same problem the same way and expecting a revolution. I call it madness. And what we are doing as KCB is we are leading this. We are going to create in the coming year a project of 5,000 housing, 5,000 units. Mm -hmm. We are working with some partners from, from Brazil and from Mexico. Okay. And you're known to be big. I've heard you speak about this before, um, transformation agenda, and as far as changing the fortunes of um, financing, um, especially the populace. What is it we need to be focusing on now? What is it your role that you must play, but also the citizenry as well? I mean, as the financial institutions we see is that the role we must create to unlock. So three problems I see today that we have to really work on. We have younger people, the youth. So many of them below 30, educated or out of either university, college, tertiary, high school, primary school, coming into the job market, no opportunity. They need 
services. They need financial services. They need inclusion. We don't have that. And so it's a partnership between us and government. And I love what the government is doing, for instance, on the, on the NYS. So you're building opportunities for young people to be engaged, to create an income, to reimagine they can become better than today. It's about giving hope. It's about building new businesses. So entrepreneurship is a new way we like to provide financing as a financial institution and formalizing the sectors that generally we see as informal. So livestock was one area we picked up. But we can do the same thing with domestic services. We can do the same with the carpentry. We can do the same thing with mechanics. We import a lot of vehicles in our country. Right. We can build mechanics. Look at housing. One of the biggest problems we face in housing, we don't have the foreman, we don't have the masons, we don't have the carpenters. These are, these are great jobs. Globally, I want my kitchen sink fixed, not leaking every other week. Correct? They don't leak even in the world. So we want to, we want to be able to give them the tools we want to give them the capital. What do they lack? What do they lack? They lack the tools. They lack the power. So, and that's where we like to build the skills and capability for those resources. So, if you look at the next front, what will shift the fabric of our society is around entrepreneurs, small, medium, and micro enterprises. And if you look at our partnership, so we start with enabling you on our mobile banking and partnership safari coming to come in fast, so you get more information, so we get some credit. It could be a mama boga today, Sophia, who is selling just ten bills. Eh, of or even one bill of, of Skumawiki, or selling 10 crates of milk today just outside the, uh, Kawangware. That's what they're selling. We want them to double that in the next year. So for entrepreneurs, how is it as KCB and the banking industry in general, you see as would be your contribution and support to encourage them to you know, go ahead and invest, but also ease of business as the banking industry? Now, let me say, Sophia, that as a bank, we are very prepared. We are working with many institutions. So for women, for youth, we are supporting the government 30% in terms of supporting the entrepreneurial startup, middle ones and large ones. We are actually we are the largest bank today on small and medium enterprise. So providing financing, trading. We have got a Biashara Club today that connects over 20,000 entrepreneurs today. We want to build this to 1 million in the next two years. That can then showcase our challenge today in the continent is about benchmarking excellence. We want to be able to become as global-centric as we can in all our businesses. If you had, Kenya is an innovator on, on mobile money. If we look at mobile money transfer, Kenya is a global innovator. We want to position Kenya on other areas, horticulture, tourism. We want to be there. So KCB is bringing forward and saying we have the experience, and we've actually dedicated that up to 25% of our total business that we do in the next five years are going to be supporting our, all our entrepreneurs, not just in Kenya, but in the region. We also focus very strongly on agriculture because a lot of entrepreneurs are also in agribusiness. How do we convert and enable their business to leap using the financing we can offer? Yeah. And we also partner with bringing in experience. So we're working with a lot of international organizations, the USAID, for instance, the World Bank, for instance. We're working with them very closely to say, can we build the knowledge that you have globally for our entrepreneurs? Because the challenge is the same. If you're in horticulture and you're doing vegetables for export, the challenge is the same. Can we give you that opportunity to scale up your business? Yeah, and with this conference, or the summit being held here, there will be a lot of focus on investment. So Correct. what is it you describe um, Kenya as in terms of an attractive destination for investment? You know, I always say, in my view, because we are a practitioner in Kenya in the region running businesses, Kenya in terms of the ease of doing business, by far is the best that I have seen in the region and in Africa. And I work because we, I speak this because strongly we run businesses. We are not speaking from second generation. Yeah. We are speaking from first hand experience. And you said substantially. And because we open businesses, we run businesses, we are able to invest, we are able to get capital, we are able to get technology, we are able to get solutions, we are able to get the resources, we are able to get the people. So, in terms of what the business requires, Kenya is second to none. I mean, we may be having a, a business index that is showing that we are not as strong, but I have always given my own feedback to say that Kenya, and that's why the, global, the summit coming to Nairobi is a big endorsement about our preparedness. Yeah. There was no other place. But I also say that as a young leader in this moment, it's a chance for us to take the opportunity to excel as entrepreneurs in this summit. You know, the time to say it is some words should disappear in this summit. You say we cannot do. This is time for our business community to say we want to dare to do that we believe is impossible. Mm -hmm. That is what will change the destiny. And if you look at the younger generation, they are unbounded. They are both creating possibilities. And every, I love it when I see a smaller business starting up with 1,000 shillings, 2,000 shillings. In one year, they are into a million shillings. We create a million of a million business people, that's a trillion shillings. Yeah. And that's how we start creating greatness in our country. And then the market is ready for us. You know, we're looking at the East Africa. This is the biggest market for us, 135, 140 million people, including South Sudan. So Kenyans can actually be catalysts in the business. So I am very proud to see 
the creation of history. This is a historic moment. Mm -hmm. For the last many years, we have not seen the summit coming to Nairobi. And I think that we'll use this to define the future destiny of yeah. Kenya and the region. And so to someone who wants to come and invest in Kenya, you tell them this what? Today, I mean, they are ready. If they come in today, look into the market, the time to invest is now. Yeah, it's not about tomorrow. And Kenya is not a market where you're going to go and start thinking and reflecting and saying, can I go? We have many investors in Kenya for the last 10 years. Let's look at American investors in Kenya. We work very closely. General Electric, one of the premier American institutions investing in Kenya, regional center here. We work with them for many years. If you look at many other institutions, Microsoft, for instance, you know, MasterCard has been here for many years. And those are the pioneers. So this is not a pioneering business anymore. Yeah, if you look at people today that are in energy, Kamak Energy, for instance, which is business running here, they're in our country. So the question for me is to say, can we run forward to connect and plug in in the Kenyans' journey of success and build better lives, better institutions, better businesses, and overall leapfrog the economy? We want to see ourselves doubling our economy today, the goal, in line with Vision 2030. We want them to be partners. So I, I believe that if there's one exciting item in this decade, in this generation, the summit will make it possible for us to achieve and take some lessons to run our business faster in this generation. Yeah, and Kenya third fastest uh, growing economy. What, what is fueling that? Again, the reinforcement globally. There are few, I mean, this, this is also the contradiction that we always speak about. But what I see is convergence. It's not by exception that we are the third fastest growing economy in the world. And the GS summit is here, largely because if you look at infrastructure, you look at ease of doing business, you look at tourism, despite the difficulties we had this year and last year, you look at agriculture today, you look at uh, housing, if you look at the knowledge, even the human resources that Kenya has, the openness, you just need to go to any city in the world, you will find Kenyan entrepreneurs. Yeah. It doesn't matter where it is, San Francisco, in London, in New York, in South Africa, in Lagos, you will find them with the same effort, the same push. What I believe is that if you dream bigger, you dream to become global, you become totally a leader in the market that you play. Yeah. Some of the insecurity incidents we've seen in the past have really affected, again, the business uh, industry, investment, tourism, as you mentioned there. What is it also you tell to those who want to invest but continue to look at that card and see how it has, hard and see how it has affected some of the business uh, in as far as still going ahead and knowing that perhaps as some who have, analysts have said that terror is a global challenge. It is not uniquely to Kenya. Um, so what is it you tell them? I, I always say that businesses that are looking more longer term, they tend to see the opportunity. I mean, insecurity comes. And I'm, in Kenya, we are working very closely in partnership with the government, the ministry of ministries that look at how do we invest. This, and I'm very much proud about the technology deployment that the government is doing. We actually haven't had major security incidents in the last few, the last few months. I, I think for us, the question is how we as private sector collaborating in partnership with government institutions to bring it, because these people we know. And when you look long term, you invest. This is one aspect. The second aspect I always say is that there is investment already happening across different sectors, you know, and then we also have to enhance the issue about doing good for business, the code of business conduct. Are we ethical in the way we do business? Because a lot of our security issues isn't because we don't have the equipment and the operators. It's because we need to build a fair process. We need to be able to have a code that people respect in doing business. And if you look at uh, our businesses for years, we still remain successful for the last many years operating in this country. We have seen more difficult country of insecurity. I mean, we operate in South Sudan. It's been more difficult for us. But Kenya has been much relatively a center of space, of stability going forward. And so we need to believe and invest in the future of our security for our country, not just leaving it to government alone to run the race. Yeah. The role of private sector uh, in terms of growing the economy further, the country, and even as people come, come to invest, what is that role for the private sector that must be played? And what are those um, areas that you see there being challenges as well? Well, so, you know, have, today the biggest challenge we need to create is opportunities for younger people coming out of school, looking for opportunities to plug in in the market space mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs, as employees, as staff. And that's an area that we must collaborate to create more. We need to double the amount of jobs, triple the amount of jobs we're creating today, perhaps increase them by tenfold. And that is a partnership uh, effort we need to do. Private sector also must live in one code. We speak very strongly to the government and say we need to deal with unethical businesses, correct? We need to deal with unfair business practice. But we are also participating in the same business as private sector. So we can't sit on one side throwing the stones. We have to handhold each other to build in the words of our head of state, to say, join us in the journey of transformation to create
create a better country in terms of business environment. Okay, let's talk back to KCB. And, and you announced uh, you're seeking 300 uh, is it million dollars uh, from development institutions to shore up the loan book. Correct. What's the state of that now? Well, that's in progress. It, we're looking at our journey for the next three years. We have a new strategic cycle. But it's really premised on the big ticket project the country, infrastructure. I mean, two ways to address the challenges facing our country is to address power supply and power generation and supply access to roads and movement of goods. The third one is education, which you already have. So if I can move from Kikima in Kitui today and come to Nairobi and go back in an hour, look, I made my business. Today it takes you a day. So the government's plan of 10,000 kilometers that we are very much part of, this is a $3 billion, $3 billion, or let's say $2 billion project. We need to be able to have resources to finance that. And we'll be the largest bank. We are prepared to support. We're looking at energy sector, the geothermal project, which you see Kenya today making global positioning. We have the largest single geothermal generation plant in the world today, in this decade. And therefore, we are preparing ourselves for those bigger projects in terms of not just Kenya, but in the region. We see requirements of capital required for banks to increase significantly. So infrastructure project funding, I just came in from the Northern Corridor Infrastructure Project Summit, which was in Uganda more than a week ago. And if you look at that Northern Corridor, the railway, the roads, the ports, it's billions of dollars that we require. So we're just saying we are preparing ourselves and ready to partner in those projects. Yeah. What should your customers expect from you going forward? Um, you are, there's a lot of work you're putting in place. Correct. Um, what is it they should expect? Uh, you know, in my closing comments, really, Sophie, I would say the single largest priority for us as a business is to increase our level of experience for our customers. We want customers who come into our, to our businesses, our networks, our digital platforms, our mobile, our agencies, our branches, to be satisfied every time they come. We haven't been there yet. We haven't done a great job. For the last three years, I'm a true champion of customer excellence. I am on social media. I, I respond to customers' comments. The customers get me direct. It's not like before. So with all, we look at our Twitter and Facebook. We look at our customers who get us through uh, you know, WhatsApp or get us through our internet chats. Those customers connect with us because they feel we need to improve. And we, we don't want to be a better bank in service. We want to be the best in the service that can be. So if your hospitality sector becomes the number one in service, we want to benchmark that and say, OK, the hospitality industry is the best in service. We want to be number one. We want to be that level. So we're not stressing. We did our surveys. Now, we also want to be able to be simpler how we access and give customer services. Simplicity is at the heart of I call it simplicity is the new extraordinary. So I'm not going to, we need to see customers be able to access. And this is the innovation we created on mobile money or KCB and PESA. Say, just because you don't have 100 shillings, you don't have to be undignified to start calling someone to say, lend me. I say, you are pre-qualified, get your 100 shillings for your fare from Madare to Nairobi or from Kangemi to Nairobi. When you arrive, you can get your money and you pay back. Yeah. This is the innovation we're going to be able to create. So we're just starting. And I want to, for all our customers, uh, you know, our contact experience center today, which we have, you know, it's so far up to 300 staff that we have running on a 24-7 basis are there to give the partnership. We do make mistakes. I learn from mistakes. I follow them every single day. But we are committed by this year, by end of this year, our level of experience across our platforms, our target is to increase from last year where we were at 80% to 95%. All right. So what next for Egara? Good question. Good question. I mean, I, you know, the good thing about doing this when you're young, you have many options in life where you want to progress. Uh, you know, the future is quite open. I'm still, I still have a work to build a stronger institutions. I can play any role. I mean, I always believe that my role is not just to be a CEO today. I believe that in the future is to share the knowledge that I had with global institutions. We need to define the story, Sophia. We need to have a different story about Africa in the global market. Uh, for too long, it's one story told. Difficult people. We cannot know ourselves. We cannot lead ourselves. We cannot invest. That's not true. If we are third fastest growing economy in the world today, it means that we are positive. We are in the right arena. And I like to play a bigger role in the days ahead at the global scene, speaking strongly about Africa Renaissance. All right. And we wish you the best. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very Sophia. much, sir. I appreciate it. Thank it has you been very a much. pleasure. Thank you.
All right, this is Morning Express and a great interview there. Joshua Oigara, the KCB CEO with uh, Sophia Wanuna. Great insight there. I think today we've had some very inspiring, uh, what do I call them, interviews. Uh, we also had Joy Doreen Bira earlier on uh, talking about entrepreneurship and uh, great, great stuff there. So any entrepreneur who's out there who wants to venture, I think this is the time to do it. And like both of them have said that, uh, you know, when you're young, you've got the time, you've got the opportunity, you can take chances. So if there's any young person out there who's been wondering whether to do it or not, I say go, go for it and go deep into it. Well, that's a person of interest wrapped up right there. Now, just to bring you details, uh, in case you've seen a huge uh, smoke bellow in the skies of Nairobi, that is a fire in Gikomba, which uh, we do know that the county officials and uh, the fire uh, department is on the ground. However, they've not yet been able to contain the fire as yet. It is not yet known the cause of the fire this morning. Uh, no casualties have been reported so far, but as uh, we continue to receive the information, we shall certainly, certainly keep you informed. It's a huge fire in Gekomba, which started at dawn. You can see the pictures right there. It is not yet known uh, immediately what the cause of the fire was. No casualties have been reported. However, uh, the fire, uh, the firefighting agencies are on the ground. We do have the county uh, government represented there and uh, they are on the ground. They've not yet been able to contain it, but we'll keep you with the details coming up. We'll take a short commercial break. We'll be right back. And today we're looking at obesity right here on Lifestyle. So don't go away. We'll be right back with our Lifestyle session in just a short while.